Well, that's an easy question <laughs> because the book consists of um, pictures I took uh, with the regular White House press corps, which are in public, so to speak. And then the other part of the book are pictures I took um, where I had exclusive access, and they are the more private pictures. Yes, I did. Um, we were looking at the pictures, trying to decide what, what to put on the cover uh, to sort of show you the public side and the private side. And the, I had a series of, of pictures of Gorbachev and Bush from the Malta summit, and we liked the feeling of the movement of it. And I had this series also of, of President Clinton and Mrs. Clinton. And so it just seemed to be bring you in somehow, make it more interesting, I hope. Those were taken on a boat on the Chobe River in Botswana. No. I was about, oh, 20 feet. Um, they knew I was with them, certainly, and I was the only journalist on the boat with them. But I was not in front of them, Brian. I was uh, across the, the top of the boat. I had decided kind of to step back a little, give everybody a little space. There was no need to be that close. And I was talking to Mrs. Clinton's um, press secretary, Marsha Berry, and suddenly this whole scene occurred and I just lifted up my camera with a much longer lens than I usually use and shot that series of pictures. So I, I don't think they were aware of me, but of course, I don't know. That's right, that's um, Mrs. Nixon, Pat Nixon, and in fact, she uh, died just a few uh, months, I believe, maybe six weeks to two months after this picture was taken at the dedication of the Ronald Reagan Library. What I know about her is I spent a great deal of time with her in the first four years of the Reagan um, administration, um, following her really around the world on her Just Say No campaign, and I became um, very fond of her, very fond indeed. Well, I don't know Mrs. Johnson, really, because I didn't cover the Johnson years, um, but I've photographed her subsequently and find her um, enormously charming. I did not. I never met Mrs. Nixon. Well, Mrs. Bush, of course, I knew Mrs. Bush when she was the wife of the vice president for eight years, and then when she was wife of the president of the United States for four. And I got to know her quite well and um, enjoy her humor a great deal. No, she's exactly the same. What you see is, you know, what you get. Right, well, uh, Rosalind Carter, I, when I first started taking pictures for, for time, I was assigned a lot to cover um, Mrs. Carter, because when, when I came to time, the pres President Carter was uh, wrestling with the um, Iran-Contra situation. I mean, excuse me, the <laughs> Iran hostage situation. And it consumed his um, time and his focus. And so Mrs. Carter traveled for him a great deal. And she went abroad for him. And she went to every um, primary state where there was going to be a primary for the election of 1980. And so I followed her a lot. And I found her to represent the United States with enormous grit and dignity. 1985, I believe. The circumstances were that Time had asked me to do a uh, lead picture in the magazine on a cover story we were doing, and the cut line was going to be, why is this man so popular? So it was like, um, it was a, a sitting, a, a portrait session that I had with President Reagan, and I had just come over to talk to him about um, sort of what I was going to do with him. And I was going to ask him a lot of um, stories that I knew uh, that he could tell well, because I wanted to show uh, his humor and his charm. That was, that was part of my mission in the sitting. You know, I found him uh, to be very much like he was um, in public. I never saw President Reagan, um, you know, totally, I would say, laid back. Um, he was always quite formal behind the scenes and out front, but a formal in a very kind of graceful way with uh, he, his humor. 
showed both behind the scenes and I thought in public too. This picture, I love this picture because um, it's so much like everybody's family. Um, the, I had secured permission to be behind the scenes for quite a lot of the convention in Houston in 1992 following George Bush. And uh, we had just arrived on Air Force One in Houston for that convention week. And when I walked in the living room of or office of Air Force One, there was uh, Marvin Bush trying to corral everybody to get them ready to go out the door. Mrs. Bush was already dressed and going out the door. And President Bush just continued to um, sit at his desk, going over his notes for his first speech, completely oblivious to all of this activity in the room. I loved it. When I was a child, um, I took pictures for fun. And I didn't, uh, and then through high school, you know, I did the high school yearbook, things like that. Um, but I didn't start taking pictures professionally uh, until my early 30s. And um, I first started doing pictures of anything, children's um, Christmas, uh, Christmas cards of children's pictures or bar mitzvahs or book jackets or that kind of thing. And then it, taking pictures in Washington led me into political coverage. You know, if I lived in Cleveland, I might have photographed, you know, something entirely different. But as you know, the, the business of Washington is politics. So that's where I went. My father was a doctor as his father was before him. And my mother, who is still living, had a dress shop in Georgetown for about 20 years, and I worked for her for a while. Dorcas Harden, which was her name. I was working for my mother in the shop, and we were raising our two little boys, Mallory and I. And um, I just, um, I don't think I was terribly happy doing what I was doing. And Gail said, you know, you really love taking pictures and you do it in all, in your spare time, all the time. Why don't you become a professional photographer? And I said, how? I mean, what do you do? It sounds stupid now, but I really honestly hadn't given it a great deal of thought. And she said, I'll go into business with you. She'd been a stylist for a wonderful photographer in New York called Bert Stern. So we started together, and she would sort of do the bookkeeping, and I'd go out and shoot the pictures, and um, that's how we started. Oh, that picture was taken at the um, opening of the museum part of the Kennedy Library in Boston when I was covering President Clinton, and he went up for the opening ceremony. You know, I heard and heard very little. I saw nothing, uh, nothing except what you see. We had raced out of the vans, um, you know, in the press corps that follows the president. We follow him in the motorcade, and our van is quite far back. And when we get to a place, we have to run very quickly with all of our equipment and try and get into position to take a picture. And I had just arrived, in fact, um, in, and I didn't have a very good position and I remember lift I was quite we were quite far away and I remember lifting up my camera and hoping I had something because um, it all happened just terribly quickly so inside of course we had a lot more time and we were more settled but this was this shot I just sort of grabbed as we as we entered the library this was at the dedication of the Ronald Reagan library in um, in California and I, at the time, was covering President Bush's administration. And President Bush, of course, was a guest at the, at the dedication of the library. I hardly saw Richard Nixon. And so um, I saw him on this day, and I saw him very occasionally in Washington, and then I covered his funeral. I started taking pictures at the White House um, when Jerry Ford was president, just popping in and out. And of course, I went back to see him about this book and found him perfectly wonderful. He was really the first president that I had a chance to cover. Um, and I, um, although I really started with Rosalind Carter, I did see the president quite a lot and was very impressed with him. What I decided was, the National Geographic and I decided that since these pictures were really my personal choices, that's the, the, the book is meant to be, um, well, it is made up of pictures that I just simply liked the best of the ones I took over the years. They are not necessarily um, events. Um, I, we didn't make the book based on the most important historical event. We, we based the book on just pictures I, I particularly um, 
I particularly liked. Yes, it most certainly was. It is the oddest rum, Brian. It's a, it's a rum with these statues in it that were um, put there by Richard Nixon. I mean, he commissioned them and he had them made. And they are of all the world leaders that he met with in his lifetime. And they brought the presidents in to uh, this room for a portrait. And it was the strangest looking situation, as you can see, because it seemed to me when I looked at the picture, when I got it back, that each of the living presidents, or former presidents, kind of were totally in character as to who they were. And uh, it was just a very kind of a strange, <laughs> surreal situation. Isn't it odd? I, I don't know what to make of it. I think it's, um, I don't know what he's thinking about in that picture, but I think you are attracted right to the center and to him because he's looking down and he's thinking and everybody else is kind of self-consciously standing there not knowing exactly what's going on in that room. I've always used single lens reflex cameras, uh, Canon cameras with autofocus. Um, for my normal everyday coverage at the White House, but behind the scenes, I use a much quieter camera. I use a rangefinder, Leica, so that I can be um, more unobtrusive. The single lens reflex camera is a camera that you're actually seeing the scene, the image, through the lens. And uh, it has a mirror. Well, it's, <laughs> it's a 35 millimeter camera, and you, you can actually see exactly what you're going to get. And so when you put longer lenses on and I bring you much closer, I see exactly what I'm going to get when I put that lens on. Or if I use a wider lens, I can see exactly what I'm gonna see. I think the difference um, would be a rangefinder camera or a single lens reflex camera. A rangefinder camera, um, you're not looking through the lens, you're looking through a box with um, images that come together to help you focus instead of images that come together through a lens to focus. I'm not very good at describing this, but... <laughs> uh, that was in Ghana. Um, I was behind the scenes with President and Mrs. Clinton on that entire trip to Africa. And so I had the luxury of being able to go to outside the press pen, to places where uh, the press wasn't positioned to take the picture. Therefore, I was able to get behind him in this particular situation rather than getting the front picture. It's a luxury to be able to shoot from behind because obviously you may miss all of the action, but to me it was just beautiful in that scene. Uh, Walter Cronkite used it in his memoirs and David Gergen um, used it in his and it's been published because it won some prizes. That's why you've seen it before. No, unfortunately um, one of my problems, although it's been a benefit to me I think over the years, is I can't hear uh, much when I'm taking pictures because I'm concentrating so hard. So when I was allowed in that room after Walter Cronkite had done his uh, last interview with a sitting president as the um, head of, uh, as the anchor of the CBS Evening News, um, I was very determined when I walked in that room to make a picture because this was quite a, a collection of people. It was three months after the president uh, became, was inaugurated and it was just before the assassination attempt and um, of course didn't know that then but it was a wonderful scene and they were telling jokes and I have absolutely no idea what the joke is. I couldn't hear it and I've asked every member of that group what the joke was and everybody acts as if they don't remember and I'm not sure they don't remember. When you cover, when you cover the White House you always are working in a group um, such as this group. I think we were watching uh, the inauguration from the balustrade up on the Capitol steps looking down and that's the way I generally work. Although in this book, I show you pictures I took that way, and then I show you t pictures I took when I was the only photographer in the room. Well, she took the picture of um, the author's picture, um, but she, she has been um, 
She's an actress. She's a photographer, too. It's another talent that um, few people probably know about her, but we met over uh, our mutual interest in photography. Yes, Ketchum, Idaho. <laughs> because we were both vacationing in Ketchum, Idaho. It was taken where? Uh, in her living room. No, she doesn't, but um, she uh, does photograph uh, a great deal, particularly her own family and friends. Black and white, because I have more freedom in black and white, and I also like what it looks like. On uh, January 20th, 2001, um, President Clinton had um, seen George Bush sworn in president, and he'd gone out to Andrews Air Force Base. Right inside that hangar behind him, there'd been a um, big goodbye rally to um, President Clinton that was attended by many, many, many people, supporters and members of his cabinet. And he was walking from that um, rally uh, to the airplane to be flown um, to New York and to go back home. That picture was taken. I'd always wanted to be in the Oval Office with a president the last moments he was in the Oval Office. And that's what this is. And President Clinton had uh, signed a letter to the incoming president, George Bush, which he'd left on the desk, which you can see there in the picture. And he turned and went to the window. And I've looked at this contact sheet, and there's exactly one frame of him looking out the window. And then he turned and um, walked towards John Podesta, who was his chief of staff. and. Um, they put their arms around each other's shoulder, and they walked out um, to the waiting press on the colonnade to go over to uh, the White House to greet um, President-elect Bush. Yes, uh, this was uh, the coffee the morning uh, just before they left to go up for, for the inauguration on the, at the Capitol. Um, Brian, I get a sense of what's going on. Of course I do. I get a sense of uh, the drama of the moment or the humor of the moment or whatever. But I've always made it a policy of not to talk about what I heard, frankly, because I might get it wrong. No. It was just a few moments before the Bushes arrived. And um, the president's photographer Sharon Farmer and I were standing together and we followed the Clintons towards the East Room and Sharon looked at me and said I think we've gone far enough and she was so right it was the cue to stop and let these people go on by themselves as they walked around the floor of the first floor of the White House uh, for the last time basically oh not that often I could probably count them on two hands or maybe three. Of course I like doing covers but most of the kind of work that I do is um, is more sort of environmental work such as I put in the book. Um, I'm happiest when I see the magazine take a picture such as uh, the picture you're looking at now of Gore and play it across the page. It's a huge thrill to me. This picture um, is, to me, an extraordinary picture, and I'm very proud of it. And it's, um, in fact, not been published, but it is a picture of um, just before, going back to that January 20th, 2001, just before the Bush family uh, arrived at the White House, before the inauguration ceremony, President Clinton and Vice President Gore went upstairs privately to the quarters and I was waiting by the elevator when they came down. And I've looked through that window in that elevator in the White House before. And I looked through it, and there was the face of Al Gore just before he was to meet with the man who was to become president who had beaten him. No, sir. All my black and white pictures are taken with available light. That's somewhat what I was talking about, the freedom of using black and white. 
So many people you can't believe, except my position was very different from everybody else's. Also, um, Brian, there is a small pool of photographers on the left side of the stage. I was with the vice president's photographer on the right side of the stage, and so therefore my picture is quite different from the published pictures. I did that night, but generally I don't. Um, generally, when I'm doing a black and white picture story, that's all I have. But I knew I'd have an interesting perspective um, for a picture that was quite public. We used the black and white for private pictures, for pictures that were exclusive to us. But that night, I knew that I was both going to see exclusive things and public things. And certainly on that stage, that was a public thing. It is quite beautiful. It. Um, it was a, a wonderfully exciting moment for me. It was the, the Queen's yacht, the Britannia, left from Plymouth, England, to go over to Normandy, taking the leaders of what were the Allied countries during the Second World War over to the um, 50th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy. So I was there because President Clinton was a guest on the Britannia. This was in a church. Um, it is. I think it's the practice of most presidents to, on inauguration day, to start their day off uh, in church. And this was the Clintons and the Gores going to an early morning service. Um, and the press had left, and I was crouched down uh, by a pew and doing this behind the scenes work. And suddenly there was this reverend who was a great friend of the Clinton family said something apparently very, very funny, but don't ask me what it was. That's a picture um, on that same boat on the Achobe River in Botswana, and it had docked. It was in the evening, and the Clintons were just enjoying um, a conversation with Sandy Berger and our amb ambassador to South Africa and our ambassador to Botswana. Of course, I did think about that, but I... Um, the reason the book is uh, starts with just a few pictures of Ford and increases the number of pictures over all of the years so that the Clinton administration in the end is the thickest chapter. The reason for that is that I think I became a better photographer over the years, at least I hope I did. And the pictures of the Ford administration were really my first foray. and. I took it as far as I could go at the White House with the um, behind-the-scenes work. And so there are more behind-the-scenes pictures of, of the Clintons than any other administration. I had to put that in the book because it's such an odd picture. I showed it to um, President Bush, and he, was, he laughed and loved it just as I did. You know, when a president goes anywhere, he stands in front of logos or flags or whatever, and this was the ultimate big flag. They didn't run it. Oh, I just think it's funny. Uh, I love all the children and the, these funny hands. It's just kind of, here are these guys doing their, their thing, talking policy, and there are these little children as a backdrop, and they're all sort of in their own world doing their own thing. That's hard for me to answer because I think all of the presidents I have um, covered have been pretty darn good at that. I would say going backwards, certainly um, President Clinton was very adept at it, very good, very... Uh, but so, so was um, President Bush. Perhaps President Reagan was maybe slightly more removed and I saw more of Mrs. Carter than I did President Carter and the Fords I never really traveled with, so I'm not very good on that observation. I, I think maybe people tell me that. No, I look at the early pictures of, of Gerald Ford that I took, and they're, they're pretty um, pedestrian. They're, they're pretty straightforward. I, I also cut off his feet when he was walking, and I uh, didn't have as much confidence in myself to try different, uh, different um, angles or different positions to shoot from. I was just a beginner. Uh, those two characters are really awfully important characters. That's um, Congressman Bella Abzug on the left and um, Betty Friedan in red. And you know, when we go photograph any, any the president, or this was a candidate, uh, Walter Mondale running for president in 1984, you're always looking for the other characters who are 
in the situation, who are on the stage, who are in the Rose Garden, you're always looking for the other people because they're important. And these two women who were incredibly important in the uh, women's movement in the United States were listening to um, Vice President Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro. Because I wanted a picture in the book to show you um, the press in action because I thought it was important. And I'd, um, I'd shown you uh, working journalists, Rolly Evans and um, Novak, and I had shown you uh, my group of photographers working, and I thought that a television personality was important. And he certainly was a big player when I was there. No, and I went to his funeral. I felt very strongly having met him, um, about him. I had known Herb Block's cartoons, uh, you know, for years, and I expected someone much sharper and tougher when I walked in to photograph him at the Washington Post. And I found the nicest gentleman um, I'd almost met in the news business, and he was absolutely charming and wonderful. I went to photograph him, and I was having a, I was using lights in this portrait, and I was having a terrible time with the reflection in his glasses. And he understood that right away, and he said, oh, little lady, just a minute, and he reached in his drawer. I'll never forget this. He reached in his drawer, and he pulled out a pair of glasses that had no lenses in them. And he took off his real glasses, put on the ones with no lenses, and said, I bet you have no reflection now. And it was just fantastic. Yes, um, Brian, I only covered the White House on an every other month basis with my colleagues, and so I had a lot of free time every other month. And so I did all kinds of different photography for Time and for other magazines along the line. This was a very tense moment, really. Um, we had, um, President Reagan was about to meet with Gorbachev and sort of as a, a precursor, I think, to that meeting, he, uh, he was at the United Nations and there was talk about him meeting with the foreign minister, Shevardnadze and no one knew if it was going to happen or not. And we had a rumor that they were both going to be at a reception together at the Waldorf. Went running over, got the picture. Yes, this is a behind the scenes picture in color because uh, we hadn't moved really into the idea of using black and white behind the scenes when this picture was taken. Um, and it was just interesting to us to see um, that was his chief of staff at the time, Donald Regan, and his national security advisor, um, Bud McFarland, and Secretary of State Schultz. I have actually um, been asked on at least two occasions um, not to use a picture after I've been in a room and photographed something. They've realized that the information on the desk was sensitive, it was top secret, and that's something certainly Time Magazine um, cooperates with. And we pulled the pictures and didn't consider them for use. It was particularly important, yes, it was um, Gorbachev's first visit to the White House uh, to visit President Reagan. And I had asked to see them privately at some point during the summit. This is exclusive. He was, uh, Gorbachev was leaving uh, one of the sessions going back to wherever he was staying, Blair House, I guess, and Reagan walked him down the, the driveway. I remember this very, very well. Um, it seemed to me during the eight years the Reagans were in the White House, an awful lot of very sad events happened. Uh, the Challenger uh, blew up, and this was uh, uh, again, another memorial service. It was for the lo Marines who were lost in the terrible bombing in Lebanon. This picture has um, been seen quite a lot. People seem to be amused by it. It's a picture that was taken at a state dinner in San Francisco after the Queen had um, been the Reagan's guest uh, visiting California and it had rained and rained and rained for her entire visit. It never stopped raining. And she made a toast at this dinner where she said that she knew that the um, Puritans when they came to the New World had brought many, car uh, many uh, customs from her land, but she had no idea they'd also brought the rotten weather. And uh, the president just loved that. I was about 10 feet away from him. He and Vaclav Havel had come out of a meeting in Prague and had, um, were having a press conference.
And so, of course, the news picture that I was taking, and we were all taking, was the two of them together at the microphones talking to the press. However, often in situations like that, if you look at your subject alone, you might see something. And I saw a cold, strong-looking George Bush and was able to just simply make a portrait of him alone. And it, um, I told him when I went to show him the pictures about the book, you see, in the, picture, in the book, as you know, I have comments by all the presidents and first ladies on these pictures. Not all the pictures, but a lot of them. And when I showed this to President Bush, and Mrs. Bush looked at it, and she said, oh, doesn't he look handsome? And I said, well, yes, Mrs. Bush, this is my George Bush, Clint Eastwood look-alike. And they were both very amused at that. There was something to me about President Carter sitting alone surrounded by all these people, not looking to me exactly like one of them. He looked alone to me, and I, I just liked the, the, the feeling of the picture, of him in the center and all the players around him. In, um, in uh, the book is a picture that I took of um, President Clinton working with his speechwriters on uh, the um, on the upcoming, I guess it was a State of the Union speech, and to get him surrounded by all of his um, speechwriters, I um, went uh, around his desk in the Oval Office and I looked across his desk, and as I did, um, I noticed right in the center of his desk um, a picture that I had taken of the president and um, Mrs. Clinton and Chelsea that he'd asked me for. And there it was. And you can imagine, I was thrilled. <laughs> I looked and I said, oh my heavens, the president has my picture right in the center of his desk. And so when that picture ran the following week in time, I um, called up my editor and I said, I want you to know I'm, that picture has two of my pictures. The ma that page has two of my pictures on it. The main one and the picture of the president and Chelsea and Mrs. Clinton. You know, this picture to me, it, I, it's in the book because to me it was, it reminded me of a, a sort of a quintessential uh, Clinton moment. This poor lady who was 90 some years old at the time, 98 or something, began to faint from the heat and everybody went around her and revived her and brought her up and the president was concerned and he stopped doing whatever he was doing and walked down to her. He put his arm around her and he spoke to her and he greeted her and he made her feel so much better and then he discovered it was her birthday and he turned around, went back up on the stage, took her with him and had the entire rally sing happy birthday. Well, I mean, you know, this is some politician. My beat, I have no beat. Um, I'm on contract to time. I'm doing special projects. I'm doing a few things here and there that um, they want me to do, and I, I'm very happy to do. I was wanted to leave the White House after 23 years, Brian. Yeah. That was long enough. Yes, yes, it's my first book of my own, yes. It was a fascinating experience to me. Um, it made me, well, begin to look at the body of my work and it made me realize um, what I'd seen which you know when you're working every day you kind of forget how um, you know it's it's funny to think of spending so much time watching presidents when so many people have never see one in their lifetime and so I've begun to sort of appreciate the experience and I'm going back and looking more closely at everything and I'm having a retrospective next winter of my work not only the presidential but the other things I was doing in the months off so I'm reviewing everything right now and it's kind of fun at the Smithsonian's Museum of American History I love that picture I was it was on assignment in this picture actually for the Village Voice, and I was doing a story on um, Dan Shore because um, he had given the the Village Voice, in fact, um, the Pike Report, which had fallen into his hands, which was a report done by the um, Congressman 
uh, Congressional Committee on um, some of the, um, well, it was criticisms at that time of the FBI and the CIA. And they hauled Dan Shore up in front of the House um, to question him about where he, what his sources were. And true to his um, uh, journalistic integrity, he refused to divulge his source. And it was a very interesting time. That's a, just a, a was a, su a surprise picture. I was leaving a hearing, and I walked out in the hall, and there was Governor Wallace, and I had actually seen him only once before in my life down in Talladega, Alabama, when he was campaigning with his wife, Lurleen, who was running for governor. And I hadn't seen him since he had been shot. And um, there he was with his uh, then wife and in his wheelchair. Yes, well, that was at the White House. He was saying goodbye to a um, foreign dignitary. I can't remember who right now, but when I went to talk to him, um, he, well, President Ford was wonderful talking about all of these pictures to me. He, um, this one of uh, D Bob Dole, um, he'd chosen Bob Dole to run with him in 1976. And, um, he commented to me on what a really wonderful sense of humor Senator Dole had, what fun he was to have with him on the ticket. What I did was, um, I didn't know uh, at the time that I went to see each of the presidents and first ladies exactly which book, which pictures were going to end up in the book, because that, as you know, is a, an editing decision that's made really quite late in the game. And so what I did was I just took, I called up each president and asked if I could come visit bringing my tape recorder to ask them about certain images that I, and I just took a bunch of images, some I thought would probably be in the book, some weren't in the book in the end. And I didn't want to show them all anyway. That's an imposition. The time would have been enormous. So I just went to see each and every one of them and talked to them and they would look at the picture and tell me what they thought was going on or how they felt about it or this particular situation. And then I brought these back to the National Geographic and the editor, Leah Ben David Val and I and Becky Lascaz, who helped me with the words, matched what they said to the pictures that we ended up using. And um, that's how we, we felt it would make the book more personal. The book is personal because it's my observations of, of the presidencies as I saw them, my favorite pictures. And then some of the situations are quite personal uh, the presidents are in in this book. And so to have them talk about the pictures, we thought just enhanced the book. I was not able to see the Carters, and so I spoke, did it over the phone with them because our schedules just didn't, ju didn't work. And I must say, it was better being with the presidents in person than it was to do it over the phone. That what? was more difficult. Ronald Reagan, of course, is the exception. Um, I spoke at length with Mrs. Reagan, but there are two comments that President Reagan made to me back in 1990 in writing about the Queen's picture and about the laughing picture that you showed. And I'm so pleased I have these comments about the pictures to be able to put them in the book. So his voice is in the book. It's included because that was one of the first pictures that I think I ever took as a professional photographer. It was the um, confirmation hearings of Nelson Rockefeller, who was vice president under Gerald Ford when he um, became president when Nixon resigned. You know, in the book, I have broken up each chapter of the presidents with other players who've been in Washington, observing Washington, participating in other ways, to uh, give you um, just a feeling for the other players and also to break the book up a bit. Um, and you can't have a book about Washington and the presidency without, without our Buckwald. No, of course not. They know we're in the room, and um, certainly I wasn't very—I wasn't standing that close to President Ford in that picture. I was step, i was back, but that's when a single lens reflex comes in handy when you have a longer lens on it because you can frame the picture exactly the way you want. And if you have a zoom lens, you can come in or go out. That picture was actually taken 
that picture is in the National Portrait Gallery, I want you to know. And I'm very proud of that, but that is not a sitting. I did not conceive of that background. I did not set this picture up at all. This picture was taken, in fact, at a, um, a rally or an event for, I believe, Social Security in Baltimore, where the president was appearing. Yes, I was there, and that picture, in fact, won first prize in world press for a news picture, which makes me very proud. We'd um, gone with the Bushes to um, Saudi Arabia uh, for Thanksgiving, just, um, just a short time before uh, what was known as Desert Storm. Um, against um, Iraq. Tom Foley went on that uh, went on that trip to the desert that day with the president as did there was a congressional delegation with him. One of the one of the more amusing pictures in the book I think is 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 an image that I had no idea um, of who the man was in in the image when I took it and that is it's a picture of um, which appears in the Carter section in the front of the book it's a picture of um, Mrs. Carter in Arkansas, and in the picture with her is the governor of Arkansas, and I have to tell you that I had absolutely no idea that Mrs. Carter, uh, that I had ever seen Governor, uh, governor um, Clinton until I never knew that I'd, I'd seen Governor Clinton before he um, came to Washington as president-elect. And it's Rosa Parks, who I have never seen with dark hair because I've seen her more recently with gray hair. And I was so surprised when my friend Mary Dunn, who helped me edit the pictures for the book and, and went through the Time Life picture collection, she said, wait till you see this picture. Uh, there's a, a picture in there that I love of um, President Clinton taking a deep breath before he um, before he went up to ex accept the nomination the second time um, for president, and it was so extraordinary because he was um, I was behind the stage with him, and um, suddenly uh, they announced his name over the loudspeaker, and uh, he took this enormous deep breath as if to say, oh, here I go, and I thought to myself, someone as, as such a pro as President Clinton has to take a deep breath, just like I would to have to go out and stand there in front of those thousands and thousands of people and make a speech. What happened there was I was in a holding room behind the scenes, just me there with them, and I asked President Clinton, what in the world happened at that moment? And he said, well, I, I think that we were all just sort of sitting in a row. We were a little bored. We were waiting for an event to begin, and we were in the holding room. And I kind of looked around and said, gosh, we look like those monkeys, hear no evil, see no evil. So suddenly, they just simply did it. And I thought, am I seeing things? And I, you know, I sometimes when you know you have a picture, you can just quietly get up and walk out of the room. Well, I quietly got up and walked out of the room. Oh, yes, that's an in public. And that picture to me says, you know, this is what it's like. This is what it's like to meet a president of the United States. This happened all the time with every president. After uh, he would speak, he'd go walk the rope line at the front of, of, of the audience. And I mean, not only, of course, do I find the ladies amusing who seem to be nearly a swooning, but in the background there are these men and women who brought their own instamatics to a very fancy party in New York to photograph the President of the United States. Uh, that picture was just taken in one of those events in the old executive office building. Um, President Reagan had met with state troopers, and they gave him a hat. And, you know, to me, it shows the confidence of, of President Reagan because not many politicians will take a hat and put it on their head when they haven't tried it on first because often it'll come down to their nose or it'll sit on the top of his head. And President Reagan just didn't care. He put it right on and put it on a sort of a rakish angle. It, at, yes, at, at time.com, there are picture stories that go way, way back um, of mine. Uh, yes, but maybe I'll do another book. It's a thought. Thank you very much.